Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last news of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. McCullover. And right now, Samara has already just gone to war with us, but we must do a focus, and we are going to do... probably the Secure the Crownlands. With Vyaka captured and its vast population now under our guiding hand, a time has come to incorporate and integrate the territory. Officials must be tested for loyalty, taxes must be collected, bandits and holdouts must be eliminated, and censuses must be conducted. Only once this long process of integration is complete can we hope to see the full potential of our latest conquest finally realized. So right now, uh, a couple comments. Um, someone says we should make more military factories. We probably need to, but equipment isn't really a problem. IFVs are kind of a problem, but equipment is not an issue. Like after, after we took out the WRF and then what was it, Vyadka, and then after the, of course they took out the Aryan Brother. Equipment is fine for the most part. Of course we could use planes and we could use a little bit more IFVs, but overall equipment is really not that bad. Um, it's just manpower. Manpower problems are such a massive thing in this mod. Like or at least for. Comey, or we guess we should say Comey. So, uh, hopefully we can... Oh, white officers. Hopefully we can pin these guys here. How big are these guys? Um, they're probably 20 combo with maybe. Maybe 10, but maybe 20. But with the Principality of Vyaka in our hands, we're faced with a large body of prisoners of war. The fate of the rank and file is largely irrelevant, but what we decide to do with the officer corps is another matter. Us Sislosk is in need of skilled officers, and pardoning and commissioning some of them could help swell our ranks with competent instructors. We have three options. We can release the most important and skilled officers from prison and integrate them into our army. We can pardon the officer corps and release them from prison, but not offer them commissions. Finally, we can just simply leave them rot in prison. Oh, are we attacking them here? What is going on? Moving in there, they're probably going to try to attack us too, but commission them. Release them for more 5% more worse. I prefer the political power, so let's do that one. And do you have any upgrades? You're level 4 and 2. Infantry expert, which is okay. Larianoff is very good and handsome. But uh, we don't need to see this one either. Uh, they're still 107. Why are, they, why are they so strong still? I don't like that. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, we still get the guy we want here. Because I don't know why Shafarovich still has 107, because we can't go higher than that. But okay. Uh, we don't need to see that for now. We're still integrating this place, which is god awful for us. And black market stuff, no. We're kind of okay for now. We're planning. Um, one of these gives us only a thousand manpower. That sucks. In, a th in two months we get stuff, and yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah, none of this is worth it, so. Nope. Cool, we'll see what happens. We're actually doing relatively okay against these guys, which is kind of surprising. Let them come into the lands for now. Keep these guys pierced, or pierced. Penned. Pinned. Okay, so why are these so slow? Why are you so slow? Forests? Yeah, I don't think so, man. You just drive, drive, drive. Oh, there you go. Oh, well, this Goring's gone. Did the fat man win? Kill him off. For the love of God, please kill him off, guys. Please, 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 please. Hope we won't be... Well, we got him so ourselves. Yeah, our divisions suck. I mean, they're just god-awful. And we have all of our land auction done. Almost all of it done. And yet, we've been focusing a lot on infantry and stuff. And yet, we still can't do anything here, so... I really don't understand. But, uh, the bald man has won. You gotta keep him in place, guys. Keep him in place. Uh, anything else? Uh, realistically, no. Just go ahead and start beating up. I hate how they just have... Okay, just do that. Whatever. Just do whatever you want, then. You hold. At least we got rid of one enemy division, which is nice. And a second one, which is also very, very nice. Uh, since we're here, and they started to move around, we're gonna take Arsk next, maybe? And uh, do that. And then do that. Just defend for now, because we have no manpower. Secure the crown zones is nice. Indulge monarchists? Despite the shameful state of Vyaka and the treacherous nature of the false Tsar Vladimir, the ideology of monarchism is hardly discredited as a viable means of governing Russia. Sergei Taborsky and his monarchist faction, they are quite divergent from the rest of our front, are influential nonetheless, and advocate strongly for preserving and protecting the history of the Tsardom. To indulge Tabritsky and his followers, we could place several of his supporters in high administrative positions in the newly conquered territories of Yaka, with Daddy Tabby himself as a local governor. Well, this would most certainly allow him to gain power, influence, and support amongst the people. Could it be worth it to ensure that the holy traditions of Russia are preserved, protected, and rightfully revered? I don't know, but we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm. So they're between 8 and 10. We've already killed 17,000 manpower off, which is nice. Could be better, but it is nice. The Battle of Barcelona, um, actually you guys just hold. Don't worry about moving. Because as soon as these guys move in, we're going to attack right here. Go in. And you guys immediately go back, and you guys attack there. Pin them. Um, no, you guys go... I, I don't like these IFVs. I do not like IFVs anymore. They're so ridiculously slow. Forest, mud, infrastructure. Man, these guys are losers. Can you just move? Alright, so that's good. You hold for now. Can you just can you just go, please just go, take Kazan, and we're gonna try our best to encircle them there, 
No, you should be able to do this pretty easily. Um, actually, since we've got them in circle here, we should do that too. These guys die, which is nice. And these guys die before they can do anything, which is good. Um, you guys go there, 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 maybe. We'll see what we can do. We, we'll have to deal with these guys up here too, but whatever. Good. Uh, you might as well take Kazan. That'd be nice. You guys go there to there. I need you guys to go here to there. How? How? Oh my god, are you kidding me? Jesus Christ, why? I'm sorry guys, but this is ridiculous. They move, the second they move, they were able to get down here. They weren't moving before, and then they were able to do that? No. Just no. I'm mean, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. These IVs suck. I hate these IVs, man. I really, really do. Well, just hold. Since they're not doing too much here, just hold for now. That's fine. Uh, we might be able to do that, maybe? I need you guys to go back up. They're just taking too many v VPs right now. Yeah, these IVs are god-awful. I mean, I I never knew of such a bad division to have, ever. You find them, you keep killing them. You literally just keep killing them. You find them, you kill them. That's all, that's all it is at this point. And, boom, there you go, cool. Alright, you guys help out too. Kill them off. Um, you guys just, maybe we can take Samara. Maybe we can just VP rush them, hopefully. Actually, go there, 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 there. You could try that. We're probably getting circled on the way there, but whatever. Um, at least we're doing that. Yeah, I don't understand the speed sometimes. Like, we have the same infrastructure, same mud. I mean, I don't think the mud's too different, but we still can't move nearly as fast. But we could either do the Tartar Ultimatum. Or a measure of respect versus break the Tartars and Russian in all but name. I do like that slightly decreased coring time. So, hmm. I think we'll do the Tartar ultimatum for this one. Well, the Tartars have seceded from the motherland. They have reason to do so, after all. The Soviet Union was atrocious towards Turkic population, attempted to stamp out their passionity, passionarity, and ensure their servitude. Gumil Gumilyov has proposed a plan to appeal to the Tartars with a formal diplomatic request. If they join our state, they shall join us as equals, and have their culture honored as one that is developed and mighty in its own right. If they refuse, however, we will have no choice but to send in the tanks. We are merciful, of course, but we cannot tolerate opposition. Followed up with... A measure of respect. As fellow peoples of the steppe, and fellow conquerors, we hold a special kinship with the Tartars. Together, we have existed for centuries, traveling across the vast plains of Eurasia. Well, they are not Russian, they are our fellows and companions, and we must be respected as such. The Tartars will be given their own, own autonomy within this, our own state, where their culture may be conserved. Our passionarity is akin, and so our races are kin. We didn't get anything there, but whatever. Cool. Alright, so the next stuff is up here. I might have to do some funky stuff off screen, just to make sure that we get what we want here. So, we'll see what happens, but... Let's go there. Kill them off. The governorship of Vyaka. Vyaka, after a long struggle, is under our domain. Years of animosity between us and them have come to a head in a climactic struggle. One that, thankfully, we have won, however. The years of monarchist rule in the region has left its culture decidedly Tsarists. Something that part of our faction decided to use to their advantage. Tabaritsky's clique has begun to push to have him nominated as a Grand Duke of Vyaka. While there's no real harm done by granting him his request, outside of some extra le legitimacy for his way of viewing things, some within our faction have pushed against his move, claiming that's merely a waste of time and tiring ourselves so the Tsar stays. This decision must be made. Appoint him? There's no reason to allow him to do that. We do get more political power that way. I like stability, though. Despotism? Eh, yeah, we'll do that one. Where's that division that was here before? Uh, where... Where'd it go? Huh. Very weird. Okay. Well, we, there's an enemy division down here. What if we let them come in and took this? Because we will actually need that too, probably. All right. Are we moving in? What are we doing here? Why are you going down that way? Actually, just go there. Make it more direct. Um. Okay then. See what you can do about this. Let them spread out for now, so this way we can more easily destroy them. And, of course, we wouldn't be able to get there in time because the game just doesn't like us <laughs> or something. Doesn't make sense with me and sometimes. It just don't. It just do not. But, cut them all off from the capital. That'll be good. Actually, you guys go there to there to there to there. That'll be nice. This way you don't have to go over the river at all. And by doing it like this, we should be able to get all the VPs, right? That only makes sense, right? Hey, we have a little bit of manpower. Thank God we have a little bit of manpower. We must accord Vyaka, finally. Oh, oh, now we have enough manpower. Jesus Christ, that, you know, the western Russian area is so difficult to fight. And I apologize for my rage earlier, but 
Sometimes it's really just not fun being this frustrated with stuff, but we have one. The convention. Uh, we could do the convention first, or move the capital to Viaco. Well, we could maybe do that. Uh, Scour Samara. Samara's ours, and with it, we've secured miles upon miles of fruitful land, dozens of factories, and arsenals of overflowing with useful equipment. However, we've also inherited another less valuable thing: traitors. Sympathizers with the Russian Liberation Army and the Germans fill our new, uh, newly occupied territory, and the partisans continue to fight our forces in many areas. The solution to this problem is simple: a grand crackdown on treason, and no mercy for any poor fool who dares carry on a cause of a dead traitor. Very good. I uh, probably don't need to do that one, but whatever. Uh, actually, hold on. Hold on. Ugra. No one wants to beat Ugra up? Well, I think we'll happily oblige them. Now, we have 9 army XP, 25 air XP. We're still making some of these divisions. I did want to make some 40 combo with, so that's why we have so little um, army XP, but, you know, it is what it is. These guys are 20 combo with anyway, so they should do relatively okay. These tank these divisions just suck so badly. They're just so bad. There's no air point ever using them. At least, just... They're going to be this bad. I know they're really small combat with, but... I don't want to use them ever again <laughs> after all this. Oh, if you like to buy better in just equipment, please go right ahead, though. Excellent, finally. Something a little better for us. But yeah, I build a lot of civvies just so that our millies, we can build a lot of millies later if we need to, our infrastructure and stuff like that. So, uh, let's see. At least we have enough manpower now, finally. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Just never enough manpower. But after we scoured them, let's go and do the convention. To an outside observer, the great convention of the Passionary Organization must be a decidedly odd spectacle. The effort to get a big ten party comprising of social conservatives, radical Eurasianists, traditional monarchists, and everything in between to agree on a shared doctrine is proving to be a challenge. So, challenging in fact. Let an alternative proposal for uniting the parties quickly becoming the preferred option. Call the convergence. It consists of a vote to be held at the end of the assembly to determine the leader of the organization and the new head of state. Very good. Hey, another division. Good, 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 good. Let's go ahead and raid them. Ooh... Nice. And they should give in, but you never know. Ah, yeah, they look very weak. The final words. The convergence looms. Lines are being drawn ever more firmly as the primary leadership candidates make their last appeals to the voting membership. There are more, no more debates to be had. No more backroom deals to be made. The four men will each make a final speech and then their decision. The only other question to be decided is who will be the first one to speak, or the last one to speak. It is the most desired position in order of speeches by all four candidates, and whoever secures it has gained both the prestige of a small victory and the perceived benefit of having the last word before the vote. Who will it be? Now, I don't know why the game is glitched. Because it is glitched currently that Shafarovich has way more influence than what he really should have. Like, if we try to do this, we saw it in the last video. If I try to go over 100, we can't. And he's stuck at 107. There's no way to decrease his influence, so... Very weird. Other comments included, uh, make more military factories, like we said already. And uh, use a loud Diplo to conquer all of your Asia at the end. Um, we could do that, maybe. I might just use Consequence to do all that stuff. Um, I think I already read this one. Oh, basically the same thing, but we read this one about Biaka, but this one's about Samara. Excuse me, this one's about Samara. Um... No. No. They don't deserve it. They really don't. After all the crap they gave us. No. Line them up against the wall and shoot them. Final words. <clears throat> they refuse tribute, good for them, and convergence. The final speeches have been held, and it's time for the convergence to take place. Four men will enter the National Assembly's candidates, each hoping to emerge from the vote as president, ready to gather passionary to achieve their vision. Only one will succeed. With everything now at stake, tensions are running high. The candidates have all committed to respecting the, the Assembly, but it's anyone's guess how long that respect go sh goes should the tide turn against them. Now, I wonder what's going to happen with this. Just because I never increased Shafarovich's influence. I never did. Never, ever, ever, ever did. So, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Like, I don't know why he has so much influence. I made sure he didn't have that much influence, but still. There you go. Treasure! Hey, more political power. We love political power here. Go ahead and train as well. That'd be good. We need way more divisions where we're headed. There you go. Six. Nice. And we got a lot of peepee. -pee. A lot of peepee. -pee. Actually, how are planes doing now? We have enough anti-tank at the moment. Gun-wise, we're doing 21,000. is not bad. We could really use a few more planes, though, really. Um, tanks looking... Oh, we have a lot of IVs. Yeah, screw the IVs. I hate IVs, man. Screw those things. 
Um, tanks are looking good. Fire's looking good. Castle's looking good as well. That's all good. The last word. There was a certain melancholy in the, at that night's National Assembly. Official, officials shuffled into their seats, ma staff made their last preparations, and even the mice in the wall sat silent. It was the last one before a true leader of Komi, and later Russia at large, would be empowered. With most of the men in the room stubbornly decided on who they would support, some still stood in the middle. Thus, while does others dozed and waiting for another speech to ignore or affirm their beliefs, some sat on the edge of their seats as they waited for someone to take the stage. And the st take the stage they did. A man quickly approached the podium to give the, the last speech. But who? Gumaleo? Ah, uh, Shaverovich. I want to do all these guys. I've already done Tabby before, but Gumal Gumalyov. Convergence. Nice. Awesome. Let's see what happens. So we're pretty much done with this. We're going to be fighting the last stuff. Oh, now we're at 104. I mean, we could try it again, but it's not going to do anything. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense why Shafirovich is so high here. I might really have to do stuff, some messy stuff off screen. Collapse of Underground State Unity? Oh, boy. Yeah, how does Shafirovich... Like, even before, like, we had the whole coup situation when Comey has, like, the coup musical chair situation. Shafirovich was, like, medium. Gumil Gumilyov was definitely the highest. But I guess we'll have to wait and see here. And okay, he's at 108. That's good. He just has one more point higher. I mean that we tried that earlier and it didn't give us any more strength, but now it did. I don't understand, man. Sometimes I just don't understand the game or the mod. The meeting begins. The final struggle over Komi's future took place where so many battles had happened before, the National Assembly. First came Gumilyov, surrounded by guards, he and his representatives taking their seats in the center of the assembly. Next came Shafarovich, his men surrounding him as dutifully as Gumil Gumilyov's. They took their place to the left of the assembly. There was a short delay before Surov, his men clad in Soviet uniform with the stars ripped off, stepped through the doors. They took their spot in between Gumilyov and Shafarovich, and the venom began to spit between, spit between the factions. Verbal tussles, insults, angry whispers, finally Tabritsky and his men filed in, taking their seats on the right of the assembly floor. The stage was set for a political explosion of biblical proportions. The only thing to do now is to give the speeches, take cover, and wait for the pieces to fall. The fate of the nation rests on shaky ground. And Restoration Day. Today, the most momentous occasion in the history of our new state has arrived. This day of the reunification of the territories west of the Urals through our labor, blood, and diplomatic efforts. All of West Russia has finally come under the control of our new state. Our vast lands extend from Arkhangelsk to Samara, with a loyal and proud population million strong. For this achievement, the end of warlordism and Bolshevism in our lands, a national holiday shall be declared. And parade sold in all of our major cities. Today truly is a first step in the rise of a new proud Russia. It is a day of the beginning of the end of the motherland. The vote. It was all here. Hours of yelling. Politicians stomping their feet. Of passionate speeches and angry rebuttals. A fist fight has even broken out once or twice. After a long arduous journey and the men and women of the National Assembly rose to cast their votes on who should lead Comey into the future. Gumilyov didn't show up, but his heart pounded against his rib cage as the sounds grew. A truck was waiting outside in the unlikely case he lost, and he did not expect to lose. If he won, the plans to dispose of Daddy Tabby and Serov were clear in his mind, to be executed almost immediately, before they could escape. Shafarovich was a different story, but he would get around to him soon enough. Shafarovich hid his face behind the, his papers to hide his growing fear. Plans swirled through his heads, mixing and mashing, an escape plan here, an execution plan there. Whichever one he would need to implement, he was certainly ready. Serov's ice-cold face didn't betray a hint of nervousness. His mind had filled with plans, plans to leave, plans to stay. He would win or he would leave. And he suspected the rest of the room felt the same way, much as they tried to hide their emotions. Daddy Tabby drummed his fingers against the table. Could he do it? Could he win? If not, then what? He hadn't thought of that part of this all the way through. His half-formed plan ending at leaving the city in the car as quick as possible. Whatever he did after this vote, he knew it would decide his fate. As the votes were counted and tensions increased, it was about to burst. A man stepped to the podium and began to read, The winner is somebody. What does it mean we have to do, uh, uh, one of the following, uh, all political pertinent matters have been resolved. Gumilyov, Gumilyov has, triumph, has been triumphant. As it was always expected that Lev Gumilyov would win, it was the outcome most would thought would occur. Lev Gumilyov would enter as head of state and exit as head of state. So when it actually happened, the most chaotic the assembly got was a small murmur of affirmation and clapping from his own wing. What was much more interesting was the events immediately afterwards. Sergey and Daddy Tabby both rose from their chairs and made their exits, Tabaritsky nearly dashing to the exit while Serov at least had the brains to keep his mask of calm up as he left. No doubt Gumilyov thought as he watched them go they were going to try and cause trouble. He sighed just another thing to hang for them hang them for. His eyes flicked to Shaverovich, who had not left. What was he to do with him? It would take longer to get rid of a man as popular as Igor, but it would be done eventually. Soon enough, Gumilyov would be alone at the top, and the Eurasianist dream could finally be realized. As the truck engines outside roared into the distance, Gumilyov's joyous demeanor finally returned, and his heart stopped being so hard. He would never admit it to anyone, but he was a little worried there. <laughs> so was I, as expected. 
Very good. Restoration day, my friends. And, Lev, you're still here. Woo. Very good. Absolutely diabolical. Now, I can't remember if we can do the reunification of this one first. The Central Eurasian Provisional Authority. But I'm going to wait first, so. Yeah, a new focus tree becomes available upon the resolution of Onega. Eh, whatever. Lessons for the Unification Wars. The enemies we face in the Reunification Wars to restore West Russia were buried in their tactics, ideologies, and equipment. From the deep battle of the Communists to the maneuver warfare of our way, we have faced every doctrine that could be thrown against us, and we have emerged victorious. However, this does not mean we should grow complicit. There's always more to learn from our defeated foes, and integrating techniques and tactics from past enemies could help us refine our formal strategies even further. The general who does not adapt to changing paradigms, after all, is doomed to fall to a general that does. Hey, military factory is nice. So we have, we have factories are going quite nicely. Even though down here it's not very good. Uh, what are we missing? We're missing a little bit of rubber. We can probably afford at least one rubber, right? Brazil? Canum? No. Oh, no one likes us. Okay, maybe we... Yeah, it's not really worth trading for that then. Darn it, that sucks. Uh, let's see. What do we not have enough of? Artillery? Yeah, we need way more arty. Let's get a lot of arty. There you go. Loads and loads and loads and loads of arty. Keep training, guys. We have, There's only nine divisions, but that's okay. Lessons from the Unification Wars. Nice. And then, finalized industrial policy? Yes. The industrial base of Russia has developed since the West Russian War, despite Bukharin's disastrous policies. However, it is not developed in a sane or consistent manner. Various warlords say its grandiose industrial visions have been carried out in clashing contra contradictory ways, with redundant supply chains and technologies intended to make use of domestic resources. One of the most critical economic issues is we face is binding all of our regional economies together, making use of enhanced economics or economics of scale, and working to ensure that functional and efficient logistics systems or networks are operational, which is very good. Very, very good. Now, we're going to wait for the last land auction. We're doing that right now. Let's get some more industry. We're still on 1955 stuff, which is really sucky. Infrastructure, nice. Academic base, yes, yes. So with all of this, eventually we will become very, very good and uh, get 40 combo with infantry and just push our way through enemies. But thank God we have manpower. I mean, my goodness. Comey's not easy. It's just not easy. But, uh, academic base? Yeah, I'll do that one first. Most importantly, of all of our reforms to the new Russian state, the people's morale and political will must be revived for too long. Warlord conflict, bombings, and starvation has eroded the shared identity of the Russian people, and eaten at the Russian patriotism within the hearts of the populace. A patriotic curriculum in schools must be established, focusing on our shared Russian identity at long last. Our people shall be once more revitalized, and their hearts shall be beat with the pride of our new state. You know what? I'm going to go and get one of these guys to become a uh, 40 combo with. We don't have enough already for it, but that's what we're working on right now anyways, right? Well, we have one for production and 30 from foreign equipment. Hmm. But it doesn't matter to me. Finalize. I want to wait to do all these before we attack Onega, just because once we literally take out Onega, then we have to change our focus tree as well, so. Uh, well, yeah, I guess technically we have to do that anyway, so. Look at this handsome guy. Ooh, Sislovsk. I've heard that Gumilyov will shape our dreaming. Yes, he will. But um, he's not very well represented, apparently. In this mod, like his actual beliefs and ideas are different than, um, or not maybe different, I'm not really exactly sure, but maybe a little bit different from what the mod uh, developers portray him as. And actually, we're gonna spend as much as we can right now, spend, and actually, we're gonna spend for the military as well, just because we're gonna need that. We need to invade Onega, which would be good. Uh, we declare war on them, give us a little bit more time than that. And for this stuff, since we saved up so much PP, just do that, it's fine. Do all this stuff, actually. Poverty, agriculture. Uh, Army professionalism, weekly manpower. We don't really need that. We do get a little more stability, so we don't probably need to do this one. We have enough manpower for now, and weekly stability works for. Uh, we're kind of okay. We just ran out of political power pretty much. Do that. Oh, look at that flag. Oh, that's what the flag we have right now. Okay, I didn't know that was going to be our flag. Okay, so let's let's start at least this one. Get through about seven days, and then go to War Onega, uh, ish maybe. Ten days left, which is totally fine with us. So spend, 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 and make, make, make. Oh my gosh. And we must have an overextended administration, right? Yeah, oh my gosh, I hate that so much. Oh, oh and supply consumption is so bad too. Oh no. Alright, you guys are almost done. You're good enough. 5% not bad. And we have a massive deficit, but whatever. Hmm. I don't think I read this one yet. Expanding our logistical ambitions, another issue that we must face is our lack of coherent centralized railroad systems. While warlords did indeed build roads, they were often insular and limited, not connected to roads and other fiefdoms. 
an understandable priority, but one that we must most rectify. New bridges must be built over rivers that once formed borders between warring states. Collapsed tunnels must be re-excavated, and miles upon miles of road and rail must be laid to build the new ties that bind us together as a true nation, rather than as a mere collection of smaller states. You know, you, when you guys you know watch my videos, sometimes you, you, you always see like me struggle or whatever. How often do you guys see like Comey win in West Russia? I kind of want to know. Like, usually they don't win. They usually just do not win. So I want to know, like, with, when you guys play, does this do these guys win? Does Comey win in your campaigns? Because usually they don't. Usually it's a WRF, I think, in my campaign. So I just like to know what other people are thinking in how often they see Comey win. How often do the opposition? Well, we've already done that one earlier, but. It's kind of weird we can't hunt down Tabretsky and all those others. At least not yet, but it makes sense. We'll, we'll probably do that later on. Yay! We got that done. Oh, wait. Oh, we can move the capital of Yaka. I don't want to waste political power. It's not wasting political power, but I don't want to use that one. I kind of like it where it's at right now, so we don't really have to do that. And we're going to have to take out Onega quickly anyway, so... Whatever. And... That's a lot of divisions right there. Alright, so they declare war on us. No, that's four divisions. That's a lot of guys. Four divisions there, too. Oh, I don't know if we'll actually be able to do this part. Can we actually break over here? Oh, yeah, we can. Okay, that's not bad. Nice. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Alright, they have one left. That's good. We just gotta be smart about this. Oh, we have 15 divisions. We just made six more divisions. Nice, 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 nice. You guys help out right here. Break over the river for, real quick. All we need is Onega, but still. That should give us some nice army XP. 55 army XP. God dang. Go in. And once the Onega breaks, we're gonna go in all as fast as possible. Go, 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 and they're gonna capitulate, hopefully. Yes, they do. And go over here and just rush. Bomb rush the Finns. We don't like Finns here. And actually... Oh, integrate Onega. Now, we should have a new tree. Yep, there we go. Cool. The Ideocracy. Or, Ideocracy. The core of the Eurasianist project must be its mode of governance. Eurasia will be something distinct from other nations that has preceded it, and will require very particular structure in order to function correctly. This is the Ideocracy. A socio-political structure which places the maintenance of Eurasianist ideology at the forefront of all of its endeavors and policies. All the other concerns are secondary, for little else exists to bind Eurasia together at this stage of its development. Go, go, go. Oh wow, these guys are really kind of poking into us, huh? That kind of sucks. Whatever. We have 15 divisions, which is awesome. I think that's just amazing. Sports rival, if you want to read about that, please go ahead. This happens every single time when we reunite Western Russia. Beat the crap out of the Finns. We will not rest until all the Finns are dead. They have up to 10 divisions. Nice. And especially, our, all of our guys are 20 combat with, except for these stupid IFVs, which will make main battle things eventually, but whatever. Alright, so since you're there, you might as well just go over there, too, if you can. Are you actually going to be okay with your speed this time? Or are you going to be stupid? Good, good, good. After this one. Uh, clear, clarify ideological precepts. Uh, that's to frame framework of the grand design. Outlog public meetings. Oh, no, I'm a more pee-pee. Cleanse unwanted axioms. Inferior corruptive Western influences continue to spread within our great nation, much to our shame. Ideas of our ideals of plutocracy, liberalism, and socialism grow like a tumor in the body of our citizenry. There's only one cure to slice deep with a blade of truth and cut out the cancer. A campaign of ideological purification will begin immediately. Classrooms, churches, homes, no place is safe from the Western poison, but nor is anywhere beyond the reach of our agents. Let the cleansing of our nation begin. The anti-communist officers. So this happens, this happened last time as well, so if you want to read this, like with, this is about just Onega, so, like everything else, let them rot in prison. The Hand of a Ruler. Lev Gumilyov pondered the great Eurasianists that had come before him, Genghis Khan, Tamerlan, Yekaterina. They had many things in common, but the most important was their understanding of power. They demanded complete obedience in their subjects and didn't suffer anyone to question the rule. That was the only way to harness the indomitable spirit of the Eurasian nation. And if it was ever to pick up the mantle of those great rulers, he had to demand the same. That was, of course, the purpose of the reorganization of the administration. The Passionary had done a commendable job getting him this far, but it was time to relieve them of their administrative burden. A loyal bureaucracy would only enforce his will over the provinces and leave the Passionary free to continue their most important work. To educate the Eurasian people on their past and to erase the legacy of the petty regionalisms and tribal nations. The Fist Titans. Uh, weed in the Garden by name. It uh, reduces administrative strain. We lose PP, we get more stability. I want to re reduce administrative strain as fast as possible. Academic monthly exchange. Oh, that's very good. Spider's Web. Oh, you get even more political power there. Oh, but you lose political power there. But you get even more political power. <laughs> There's so much PP. Oh, that is really cool. Circles within circles. That looks really awesome. 
Happy Symbiosis. I want to do all this stuff, man. I really do. But we'll do Framework of the Grand Design next. We require firm foundations and sturdy scaffolding upon which to build a new society. There must be redundancies, backups, contingency plans for anything and everything that might go awry. This, is, this strong bureaucratic framework will be the backbone of our nation. It must be tailored for maximum efficiency and solely accountable to the conductor of this grand symphony. I want you to keep beating the crap out of the fins. Beat, 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 beat. The Western Offensive, huh? Nope. Never have peace with those deplorable fins, man. Never, ever, 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 ever. I, how do they move so fast? How do they move so fast? Oh, but if you want to read about better agricultural methods, please go right ahead. For this bread, we thank thee. Absolutely. Beautiful. Wow, well, we really don't have that many civvies, huh? That sucks, but that's okay. <clears throat> Good, now get back to the rest of the line. Cleanse unwanted axioms. Uh, now we get point nine three. Not bad, not great, but could be better. <clears throat> Inspires web, a legion of scribes, left in the dust. With an unassuming bar of an international Naya street, three men sat in silence. The sounds of their drinking was the only thing to break the awkward silence between them, brought about by a very troubling subject looming over their heads. Despite their differing ideological backgrounds, they were united in one aspect. Lev Gumilyov and his Eurasianist had cast them and their respective parties aside. One man, who considered himself to be part of the Passionaries Reformists, a size began to speak first. You know what the worst part is? They wouldn't have gotten this far if we weren't if it weren't for us. We were once a single party united in one glorious purpose. We had our differences, sure, but we all knew our goals were aligned. Now we're being thrown away like garbage. A second man, a monarchist, took out mockingly. Speak for yourself. I never trusted the dude to begin with. I don't understand why the OVRI hitched their wagon to them in the first place. Monarchists working with a man who has no interest in preserving Russia's sacred institutions? What a joke. The third man. A died in the wool or the socialists interjected. I think we can all agree Gumilyov was never going to keep us around, but what he's do what's done is done. That madman now has a nation in his grip, and all of us helped him get there. If you ask me, we only have ourselves to blame. The trio went silent again. The Seravites had spoken uncomfortable truth, and nobody wanted to confront it. The now illegal self-factions of the Passionary were merely disposable political tools for Gumilyov, and did not realize it until it was too late. Their services are no longer, of course, required. We actually have 46 billion in, in GDP, not bad. Eurasia is, in the main, a scientific project. It will never hold itself together without bureaucrats, administrators, and other assorted public servants who account for every detail and keep the machinery of our state well oiled. Our administrative apparatus, therefore, must be even more expansive than that of the Soviet Union. We need men of every ethnos represented in our territory, covering every possible field of work, industry, banking, military, R&D, diplomacy, and ethnic affairs. Nothing can be left to the ordinary pencil pushers. Absolutely. We're still working on that, which is good. And let's keep working with this stuff. More factory output, because that's always good to get. IRA steps down. Okay, have the Irish finally stopped fighting each other? Perhaps. For, perhaps for now, maybe. Level 4, not bad. Oh, no, no. We want to keep boost, 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 boost that up. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll improve everything here later on. We spend a lot now, and which we will reap the benefits later. Hopefully there are benefits. Uh, help them out. We don't want it. too much of a struggle here. We are struggling quite a bit, though. Because even though we're stuck in kind of the north, the south portion is doing quite well. Well, I'd say they're doing quite well, but if they move, that'd be okay. Legion of Scribes. Very good. Are they making more divisions? Yep, they're definitely making more divisions. How much manpower does Finland actually have? Hold on. Let's take a look. The purity, not bad. 13,000, so we keep attacking. They're going to all... Actually, they're all going to die anyways. Um, They have a few guns left and some support equipment, and that's it. That's it. That's literally it. Uh, after that, you guys, if I can trust you guys, you just go here and then there and there, and this should be it for the rest of the war, hopefully. But, interlocking fields. Oh, nope. Like the region super ethnos itself, the concerns of the state and society form a single contiguous whole. Nothing done by a single subsection of the bureaucracy occurs without affecting another, and if one domino falls, the rest will follow. The solution, however, is not to divide the bureaucracy, quite the opposite. Tightening its structure and giving them shared responsibilities will force them to work together more often, and therefore become more efficient over time. We can also hereby avoid factionalism and the red tape so that so often clogs the governments of lesser nations. That'll be very good. Do we need to lose a division? Wait. Tru trucks? Guys? I literally sent you to go to this one. You must have lost a battle or something. Advanced competing machines. Nice. I don't care what the cost is. We must kill all the fins here. Like, like there's there's no piece of the fins. I want that body count to be even higher than 76,000. That's not enough. That is def absolutely not enough. 
A legion of scribes out. Your age is civil servants. The group of rejects stood outside the small office denied once more the chance at a job. They'd visited almost a dozen different places, but they were all turned away. Abram felt like it was about time to give up. He was used... He used... It was hard to come by literate people in Russia, evidently. However, you had to know more than just how to read and write to become an accountant. <clears throat> Maybe we could try Gorky, one of the other men said. I heard it's expanding very rapidly for a city in Russia. There has to be places to get a job there. Well, it's that or we joined the army, Abram replied, and they began to walk to the train station. An older man with a long beard passed by as he overheard the conversation. Did you just boys say you were looking for a job? His voice was scratchy yet stern. From where I'm from, we have a mighty few of those. And where's that? Your family farm? Abram said dismissively. Sorry, old man, we don't want to be farmhands. Oh no, I work back in Sictifkar. Eurasia can't administrate itself, unfortunately for us. We could use a few good of you as scribes, writers, and whatnot. Nothing beats being a bureaucrat, you know. And hey, the pay is pretty darn good as well. The old man paused to let them think it over. It beats long hours in a factory or dying in the army, said one of the young men. I'm in. I think we all are, Abram replied. They'll be perfect for the job. Interlocking fields. Nice. We lose political power, but get more political power. I love that. They're sacrificing all of their, their boys to defend themselves. I mean, that's pathetic, Finland. Finland's gonna have to die. Why? Why, Why are you going that way? Go, 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 go. Man. I just want to kill off the Finns. Is that so much to ask for? We've only killed off 82,000. We lost 42,000, but... A 2v1 against, you know, them. Not bad. Oh, and I knew Omsk would do well here. Now, we have to be careful about Omsk, because they will go to war early on. You guys, just convert you to 40s. Deploy them early, and you're done. Nice. Cool. Convert them to 40s, too. We're not going to have enough artillery for this, but it doesn't matter. Russian victory? You bet it's going to be a Russian victory. Uh, we're going to need some more of this as well, which is fine. Whatever. I'm going to keep making some planes too, so. Uh, fighters? Not bad. And some gas. So we're really just setting ourselves up first. I mean, like I've said in other videos before, the Warlord era, the Warlord stage for any like group is the most difficult. The second stage can be difficult, but it can also be quite not difficult, so. It is what it just it just is what it is. The spider's web. Our great god and savior was once mockingly referred to as a spider in the politics of the Komi Republic. It was said that to enter the rightest block of the assembly was to entangle oneself in a web of shadows, one which grew ever tighter around one's throat the deeper one sank into Gumilov's intrigues. Perhaps our foes should have been more careful with their insults, for that is exactly how the guide of the revolution would have it. Eurasia is a descendant of a thousand ethnicities and cultures, all caught up in a geographic web that drew close and bound them together. When the same is true for a state, with the lowliest farmer and the highest general alike all bound to the will of our leader, our strength will be unassailable. As it should be. And actually, can we integrate places? Uh, we need, it has to be 69 before we can do this, right? So, yeah, 69. Hunting down opposition. I don't know why we sell this. Uh, just, I don't want to spend political power on that, so. I'll do it anyways. Why not? I don't want to see that anymore. There you go. We've done enough. So, I don't know. It just wastes a PP there, but whatever. All right, so you guys will do okay. Now, they will attack these guys down here eventually, but we'll have to wait and see. Interlocking fields of spider's web. More PP? Thank you. And puppets on silken strings. All Eurasians are a part of a super ethnos, but assimilation shouldn't mean annihilation. Ours is not a degenerate melange of inferior cultures with nothing alike, but a union of races and cultures that remain distinct while being subordinate to a greater whole. So it is with our nation. The Bolsheviks failed to properly respect the diverse races of our super ethnos. They established the ASSRs to not represent ethnic groups, but to appease their native naive workers and ideologues with false promises of self determination. Living inside that self determination, as a degenerate Atlanticist notion, it was an inefficient and pointless system. In their stead, we shall establish a cons constituent ethnostate, a formalized system of the various ethno political bodies that make up Eurasia itself. Not bad. And we do have quite a bit of stability in war support, which is actually really nice. How are we doing? Oh, almost 10 billion. That's pretty bad, but whatever. Actually, we're still 5.7. That's not bad. That's pretty good. And then we'll do circles within circles. Eurasia's government is best designed in a way that mirrors the society it rules, as the center stands the guide of the Passionaris Revolution. Arrayed around him, growing ever wider, lie the various circles of power. Beneath Gumilyov are the Eurasianist elite, beneath them the middle managers such as priests and bureaucrats, and beneath them the peasants and so on. Some bulk of the stratification of power, but they misunderstand its purpose. This is not a naked power grab designed to establish a dictatorship, but a return to the natural structure of the Eurasian society. Eurasian leaders have no need for checks and balances when they possess a purity of purpose that eclipses all else they might desire. Very cool. Very, very cool. Let's do industry, because we're going to need that as well. We're going to focus very hard on industry right now. 
at 15, not bad, the first steps of the Eurasian dream. Today marks a great day for the great goal of our state. Eurasia will never be Eurasia without all the different peoples of Russia. Komi, of course. Tartars, Bashkirs, and finally others will be given a chance of molding their own fates. The Slav and Rus shall no longer lord over the other ethnic groups in a hegemony. We will now all go together to the Eurasian dream. Around noon this morning, Gumilyov, Gumilyov and his cabinet gave a speech, which, which was broadcast over radio and even the rare TV, announcing the creation of constituent ethnostates. These ethnostates will allow all marginalized people of the state to administer their own people, create their own laws, and speak their own languages, so long as they pledge allegiance and swear loyalty to the state of Eurasia. Today, all peoples of the great state of Russia will march forward as one, no longer torn apart by needless ethnic squabblings of the past few centuries. Russia is as much Slav as it is Komi. Russia is as much Bashkir as it is Chechen. United, none of us will ever experience the tragedy of the West Russian War ever again. Roaring applause and cheers fill the streets, homes, and radios nationwide. The first step forward is finally uh, complete. Every person shall have their place in her son. Nice. Keep spending, and now you can cut. Which doesn't do very much for us, but... Actually, maybe we should, oh, I don't think... I, that was a mistake. I'm not going to cut anymore, because we still need to get more factory output for artillery. So that was my bad. We're not going to cut anymore. Um, planes, this stuff. Honestly, it's going to be kind of difficult to take out, but that's fine. We're going to need a lot of arty, though. Loads of arty. Guns, we're not looking bad, but it's not looking super great. But, uh, oh, there goes those guys. Ethno Pluralist Agenda... Non-core manpower, less ability, ethnic vanguardism. I'd love to do that one. Ide Ideocratic elite, a singular will. I like that one more. This elder sibling, not bad. The stern tutor. Ooh, I like these a whole lot more, but it makes more sense because we're going with circles within circles and the spider's web and puppets on the silken strings. So, but I think we're going to go hit ethno agenda. We're going to do all these probably. But we'll probably do what? Administrative strain. Dismantle Slavophilia. Pan Slavism is a childish notion. Genetics matter not. The Czechs, Poles, and others are not our brothers. They are not Eurasianists. They are fallen Slavs corrupted by foreign influence and assimilated into the Rom Romano Germanic super ethnos. There is much of an enemy to Eurasia as the Germans or Japanese. The fetishistic ad admiration for our strange genetic kin must be excised from the Eurasian consciousness. A Eurasian's family is to be found in Central Asia, Caucasia, and Siberia, not in the soft and weak lands of Europe. Let the lesser Slavs become Aryans if they wish. Let them continue to collaborate. And what they do with their Middles of roll laws beyond our borders is no concern of ours. New bureaucratic training, of course. Passionary and you, the great tools of Eurasia. Pavel looked on in confusion at the pamphlet he was given. The meek young bureaucrat was placed in a makeshift orientation room in one of the state's various administrative centers across the country. This was where he was to become a cog in the machine for the goal of Eurasia. Whatever this was, he thought to himself, it was for better to help the party than be at the whims of it. A single brush on his shoulder brought him back to reality, as a high-ranking offic government official was looking at him. Are you going to stare at it or begin to read? The army is used for those who stare. Pavel nodded quietly and flipped open the pages of the flimsy pamphlet. <clears throat> Organization of the state all toward Eurasia was a section which greeted him at first glance. The text highlighted that bureaucrats were responsible for ensuring that each individual organ of Eurasia relied on each other to further the goals of the state, and as such, it was the highest priority to ensure that they work as efficiently as possible with little confusion. Pavel read on and came to a page titled The Guide of Eurasia, Lev Gumilyov. Everything done at the administrative centers, every order given in the army, and every action done at home was for the state of Eurasia, under the ideology of Eurasianism, with the blessing of Gumilyov. Without him as a great guy, there will be no Russia, let alone a Eurasia. The final piece of the section stood out to young Pavel and began to speak it to himself. Without Gumilyov, there would be no Eurasia. Delineate western boundaries? We do, we do the garden. Eurasianism has many competitors in the race to secure the minds of our people. Both foreign and homegrown ideas proliferate our culture ethnic consciousness. Even our own allies in the days of the Komi Republic were subjected to these poisonous, fallacious ideologies. This will not do. There is room in Eurasia for only one vision and one mind and purpose. No voice besides the guide of the passionarist revolution matters. Anyone who claims otherwise must be smothered, their words consigned to the dustbin of history. And name by name. Very, very good. And we currently get 1.77 a day. Wow, that's... That's pretty nice. That's pretty darn good. Strange times in a strange land. Two angry men. The bar wasn't crowded as it was midday, yet it could have sounded like it was with the yelling and shouting coming from the two angry men inside, even be being heard from across the street. Two men alone in a bar never ended well. Russian ideas matter above all, Victor argued. Even you, Samson, cannot disagree that Russian nationality is a sin of Eurasianism. Russia is in the middle of Eurasia, and therefore Russian morals must be prioritized Russia overall. It could be so much more, though, argued Samson. Slightly calmer than Victor, although that wasn't much. We are much stronger united into Eurasia, and not divided under Russia. Working together will only give us a 
of strength to defeat our enemies. Russian domination only divides us, Eurasia together. These Eurasianist or Eurasian ideals will only continue to destroy Russian culture, Victor Seed. Who will be classified as Eurasians next? The Chinese, the Japanese, the Germans? Nationalism is a relic of a bygone era, shouted Samson, now trying and failing to be louder than Victor. A new age is dawn, Victor. Soon you'll see the strength of what Eurasia can be. I doubt that, felt Victor said as he took his bottle and walked out the door. He'll come around eventually. Kicking and screaming, but probably. Alright, so with you guys here, uh, let's do this. Everyone here is going to be on the line and plan, because Omsk, they're not easy. They're definitely not easy. This campaign so far has not been very easy. <laughs> but it's always going to show you guys how much I can struggle here too, I guess. Cool. Actually, you guys are still doing that. That's fine. Get some of that too. Cool. And I'm spending. Actually, spend. Spend and spend. We're going to spend a lot. We are big spenders here. Just delineate the western boundary. Or parasite. Let's do the parasite. Chimera. Eurasia is infested with a foreign parasite, <clears throat> an ethnos of tradesmen and hucksters who inveigle themselves into our blood and nation. This ethnos lacks a home of its own, and so they wander the world like a migratory infestation of lice. They care only for profit, and so carry with them a pan panoply of invented and foreign ideas to influence our civilization to suit their purposes. In truth, it isn't entirely their fault. The vagar vagaries of evolution have led them to becoming a race of vampires. Still, as foreigners, they have no place in Eurasia and must be expelled post-haste. Perhaps they'll find a home and stop bothering us, or else settle amongst more gullible races than are ours. Either way, they shan't be a problem for much longer. Very good. Even more research be please. Thank you very much. And keep producing. Good. 20 and 3. Nice. How are we doing with all this stuff? That's still pretty bad. One a day is really bad. More anti-tank. Um, at this point... With 23 divisions, that's not bad. How many divisions does Omsk have? I can't imagine they'd have that much. They have a lot of manpower like us. Yeah, we're we're similar to them. We're definitely similar. So, I guess we can cut them down for now. Cut that. Go to two for now. That's fine. Name by name. When Officer Nikolai Smirnov was focused on his desk work, it took a great deal of effort to shake him from his concentration. So, it was that when he heard a pair of heavy footsteps approaching his desk, he didn't pay much mind. Only when an envelope was tossed at the top of the report he was filling out did Smirnov escape from his rhythm. Smirnov slowly raised his head to see a rather imposing figure in a heavy trench coat, eyes obscured by tinted sunglasses. Give this to your superior, he said, his tone curt and rough. Before Smirnov had a chance to respond, the man had already turned to leave. All that remained was a mysterious envelope suspiciously lying on his desk. Smirnov looked, took a quick check of the surroundings before, snatching it open and tearing it open. When he saw it confused him at first. Alexiev Ogleg Morozivich, former KPK paramilitary liquidate. Nikiforov Matvi Karolovich, RMP associate, apprehend. Semenyov Semenyon Grigorovich, suspected foreign agent, liquidate. A for, an off, the officer felt pressure from forming his chest as it dawned on him. This was clearly a collection of people the government wanted gone. Feeling too morbidly curious to stop, he nervously continued to scan the ominous list. As his eyes made their way down row after row of condemned men and women, one particular name stood out amongst the rest. He felt a chill creep down his spine when he realized who it was. Smirnov Nikolai Alexievich, former PSD member at Liquidate. The rush shall be accessed one name at a time, and delineate the western boundary. Eurasia's borders are set in stone, literally. The motions of the earth have conspired to give us precise and expansive natural borders. The Carpathians, the Caucasus, the Tyrum Basin, all hemmed in neatly by the Baltic, the Arctic Circle, and the Pacific Ocean. For now, what concerns us, mo in, us most in the western border? That lies along the Baltic coastline and the Carpathians. Nothing beyond that line is worth possessing. Everything behind that line is the land, the people, the resources belong to us to be utilized as the state sees fit. Very good. As they see fit is very nice. Someone advocates, an aristocrat, and a gentleman. Oh boy. Nice. 70, not bad. Now, Omsk will be going to war with these guys soon, eventually, so we have to be prepared for them. How's society doing? Society's doing quite well, especially. Oh, lines? Not bad. Eviction notice, Directive 19 on the expulsion of the Chimera Ethnos. Ethnoses. As of September 1st, 1966, our guide has decreed that all peoples belonging to the Jewish or Roma ethnoses are to be deported from Eurasia's borders as soon as possible. If you belong to these groups, please present yourself to the nearest Eurasian National Army checkpoint or your local police station to be processed for immediate deportation. If you do not report to the authorities in a timely manner, you are incapable of doing so, or if you are incapable of doing so, the authorities shall be deployed to ensure your compliance. Understand that these drastic actions are being conducted for your own good. Your societies and that of the Eurasian superethnosis are not simply compatible. It has been decided that it would be prudent to separate the two to prevent inevitable conflict between ethnicities. Our guy believes in the strength of Eurasia's passionarity and to continue to make accommodations for a race that has no homeland of its own to speak of what would restrict the potential of our civilization. Comply with the authorities and you will not be harmed. Should you resist for any reason, the consequences shall be grave. Do not make this critically important process more difficult than necessary. Glory to Eurasia. Our civilization has no need of them. 
and happy symbiosis. Now that the Atlanticist, Romano, Germanic, and the vampiric influences have been purged from our nation, we can finally turn inward and begin building what has been denied us for centuries. At long last, the Eurasian Superethnos is in charge of its own nation. No longer do we need to fear foreign uh, taint, reducing our people to feeble, freedom-obsessed weaklings. It should always have been this way. Had we learned sooner, fostered solidarity rather than hatred towards our own kind, we might have never fallen from grace, but none of that matters now. In the end, nobody could stop us. The Eurasian Superethnos ascends, and all the world trembles before raging friar of the passionarity. And there goes the commies. Reduces strain, open immigration. Oh, wait. We have open immigration, but we are deporting people. Okay. Academic base and industrial expertise goes up. Nice. Alright, so let's actually just spend. Spend the crap out of all of the money that we don't have. Because we need some more output. Ah, that's so much better than it was before. So much better. Happy symbiosis. Very good. <clears throat> and then clarify ideological precepts. The ideocracy... Idea... Idiocracy is still in its infancy and an unsteady on its feet. The threat of unorthodox thought looms large, threatening the Eurasianist grip on power. Ideological deviance is death, but we can know we cannot know what deviance is if the correct ideological standards go undefined. Within the halls of power, there are two competing camps on this matter. This is Gumilyov's Gumilyov's personal circle of followers, those who followed in the pursuit of the Eurasianist dream from the early days. In line with their guide's original theories, they wish to guarantee the solidarity and equality of all Eurasianist or Eurasian ethnic groups. The second is comprised. Oh, well, look at. Oh! Oh, wow. Um, oh, boy, that's not good. Um, those who fall in the pursuit of Eurasian's dream from the early days. In line with their guide's original theories, they wish to guarantee the solidarity and equality of all Eurasian ethnic groups. The second is comprised of more traditional Eurasianists, following the ideas of those who preceded Gumilyov Gumil himself. They serve the need for the absolute dominance of R Russia and the Eurasian project and enjoy wide support amongst the remnants of the use of Sislovsk's other rightist blocs. Oh, no, no, no. This is very bad. How horrifying. Oh, that's oh, that's really bad. Because this will get result in, World War, in nuclear bombs flying. Oh, the Jews won in Madagascar. That's cool. No manpower left, but okay, that's cool. I'm a little worried that we might have nuclear hack fire. Content cooperation. Yvonne stepped outside the passionary for a smoke break. A calming member, Yvonne, had been a part of the Eurasianist for as long as they had been in power. He met one of his fellow colleagues, a Tartar, standing by the wall and reading a newspaper. Oh, Bennett, oh, Bennett, oh, Bennett. Elsir, wasn't it? Uh, said Ivan, wanting to start a conversation. It's always nice to see a new face. Well, yes, it is, he replied. And you must be Ivan. That's right, Ivan replied. It's interesting to see so many cultures in the passionary today. Back when I started, it was mostly just Russians. Well, that wouldn't be Eurasianist, would it? Elsir replied, smirking, you know. I do count myself lucky with who, with who came into power in West Russia. At least my people aren't brutally repressed by the state anymore. Well, that sure is right, replied Ivan. I remember back in the Republic, we were repressed or suppressed by the center and shot at by the communists. A little different now from how you were treated. At least now it's the other way around. True, true, said Elsir. Both stood along the wall, sharing the relief of where they were now. Despite whatever else happened to Russia, things had changed for them. But was it really for the better? It was good to see them working together. An ethno pluralist agenda. Eurasia is a land of a thousand bloodlines. The spirits of the Russians, Tartars, Mongols, Kazakhs, Burats, and countless more all inhabit the black soil of the motherland. The Russians are the most numerous, but we are merely first among equals, nothing more. Acknowledging this reality is our moral duty to the superethnos. Time and again, our brothers' ethnoses have been persecuted and marginalized by monarchs and reds, disguising their chauvinism as an effort to civilize. This will continue no longer. From today, all Eurasians will be kin under law. Burgundian bunkers, well, it's good for them that they have that, but... Oh, boy. Nice. Mass mechanization? We're almost close. We're almost ready to go to modern agriculture. Wow. That's going to take a long time to get there, but that's still okay. Non-nuclear power, that's alright. 25, not bad. Ah, good. More. Infrastructure, expertise. We're just going to do all this stuff just because it's going to take... We took so long to formalize our group here. Or, you know, West Russia. The Eur Central Eurasian Provisional Authority. So, I don't mind spending as much PP as possible. That's fine with us. Nice. The Eurasian Dream. Gumilyov was confused by the report. The most recent poll in Ust Sislovsk, the birthplace of modern Eurasia, showed that less than 40% of its inhabitants supported the current regime. The past eight months were filled with constant purges and police crackdowns, but every leader knows when too much is too much. Obviously, Gumilyov cannot sit around with his arms folded. Something must be done. If the brute force can't suppress the people, we will have to play upon their minds. Yes. He assembled the high government, laying down proposal after proposal. Don't you see, gentlemen, he announced. We must justify the concept to the people. How, how can we expect the peasants to work for a cause they know nothing about? But how shall this be done? asked the economic minister. Easy, Gumil Gumilyov brought out a map of Eurasian continent. We must send out expeditions across true Russia, or Eurasia, to justify our righteous cause. It will not be easy, but failure here means the destruction of an ideology, an ideology that holds true salvation for us all. Let us not delay, gentlemen. Like the con, we will ride.
Oh, that's cool. Rallying the party. The fate of the Passioners' Revolution rests upon the results of this conference. Your presence will not only help determine the path that lies ahead for Super Ethnos, but will confirm your devotion to our deals. If you wish for your voices to be heard, now is your opportunity. I shall be eagerly looking forward to your attendance. Regards, Lev Nikolaevich Gumilyov. As he concluded his letter, Lev Gumilyov set his pen aside and sighed as he leaned back in his chair. Within the day, countless copies of it would be created and passed around to each and every member of the Passionary, and the first official meeting of the party since the unification would be set into motion. Gumilyov cherished the thought of finally having the opportunity to set his movements, goals, into stone. Dealing with the other wings of this gargantuan party would be a challenge, but Gumilyov had no doubt they could be persuaded one way or another. Snatching the letter from his desk, Gumilyov excitedly made his way out of the study and approached one of the subordinates in the hall with a paper in hand. Dimitri, make sure this gets to the post office, he spoke with his usual energy. I want this letter on everyone's desk by tomorrow morning. The officer nodded as he took the letter, and immediately set off to do his guide's bidding. Soon, the Passionaries' revolution would begin in earnest, and Gumil Gumilyov could hardly wait. A new ideology is born, or just born. Oh, look at this. Oh. Despite securing military control over Western Russia, the majority of the population is ignorant of her beliefs. They are blind to a glorious past when Russia was the centerpiece of Eurasia, so we must force their eyes open. Across two continents are scattered the remains of empires, cities buried beneath the layers of history, sites unseen and memories unheard of. It is imperative that our young state send out expeditions to these states of power, or sets of power, to reinforce our position amongst the elites to ensure that Eurasia becomes a fact rather than a dream. The legitimacy of our Eurasian concept is 40. Legitimacy drops by 5 points every month. Oh boy. Oh, that sucks. Uh, project across the wall. So what are every single one of these should help us with our project, right? Denounce Atlanticists? Pan-Asianism? I guess we'll probably do... Let's do Golden Legacy? Golden Legacy. Across the wall. Like the Father? Um, the Great Minds. Just, should we leverage the U.S. state's opinion of us to negotiate an exchange of scientists? They'll send over the, the best and brightest and we'll teach them of our concepts so that Atlanticists will know who they're dealing with? Oh, the right mind. What is this? Oh, we can't do that. A final rest. Ooh. The old mother. India, far flung. Well, let's do the great step. Our southern Kazakh neighbors guard artifacts unseen by the rest of the world. Taking the opportunity of chaos, we should organize a military expedition into the shattered steps. While also showing the world that what the Eurasian National Army is capable of. We'll try it. Why not? Followed up with idiotic, Ideocratic Elite. The guide of the Passionaris Revolution has no desire to rule as a petty tyrant or tsar. He is our spiritual and scientific leader, and understands his limitations as well. Nobody, no matter how brilliant or well-intentioned, could ever hope to rule Eurasia alone. Our leader wishes to cultivate a new elite to ensure the long life and prosperity of Eurasia, elevated as necessary from the past best men that our nation can produce. They will represent every ethnos within Eurasia. These intelligent and learned young men will be gently guided by the leader, and in time will assume his burdens, so it shall be for every generation to come. Nice. So we'll do all this stuff. And industrial, horizontal industrial designs. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah, that's all good stuff. How are we doing over here? We have 23 divisions and we're still training, which is fine. If everyone can train, do it. Step some. At the center of Eurasia lies the shattered state of Kazakhstan. A long-standing ally of the Russian people, the steppe riders have fallen upon hard times. Their temples are now dust, the legacy of the golden horde of fleeting memory within the minds of aging professors. However, Central Asia is also home to many artifacts from the time of the Mongols. Vast fine vases, jewelry, sabers, and shields that, if obtained, will surely help us to evoke a sense of Eurasian unity. A call back to a greater past is necessary. Oh, we started a border war. Our commanders have concluded that the best place to search for these artifacts is Constantinia. The followers of Islam have amassed a fine collection of religious artifacts there, ranging from sacred texts to pieces of Kazakh history. The journals have advised assembling a strike force and invading immediately, but we cannot afford to be so hasty. A full-blown invasion is currently above our logistical capacity, but the artifacts we seek are very old and fragile instead. It is necessary to assemble on the board and attack with a single division. The glorious armies of Eurasia will push through, route the garrison, and carefully seize the treasures of the steppe. Well then, I did not expect us to do that, but okay. We'll wait for the final day, and I guess we'll do next, um, Project Sur Le Flair. Oh no, that's China. The Arctic? Eh, we could probably do that one. The Arctic was once home to many Russian ships. The old empire transported coin goods and traded with the far reaches of the world through its northern ports. We should send some scientists to the icebergs and islands of the Arctic Circle, but transportation is also needed. Some transport and a defense vessel will suffice. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, can you do one more here? Uh, consumer goods factors goes down. Yeah, I'll do that one too. That'd be very nice. 27, not bad. Five days left. We should do okay. They have only one horse here. And that's not very much. There you go. Cool. 
Oh, more divisions? Nice. We should do pretty darn well here, let's be real. Well, maybe not. Even at 40 combo, we're struggling. A success! Nice! Just as we predicted, the ragtag bunch of farmers that the Kazakhs call an army was forced to retreat from our assault. A group of soldiers penetrated the outskirts of a village temple, drawing the attention of its, of its garrison. The majority of Kazakh forces gave chase as our men, our forward troops, retreated to a defensible position in the woods. Meanwhile, a strike team infiltrated the undermanned town, cutting through the streets until they came upon a heavily fortified storehouse. Entering through the windows, the team extracted what? A medieval vase depicting Mongolian cavalry, a tapestry of golden horde soldiers, an old book detailing the conquest of our ancestors, <clears throat> and a ceremonial dagger. The artifacts have been transported to secure location and wait for their study. They never stood a single chance. And that's good. That is very good. Especially as these guys train more, 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 more. Project Agartha. Uh, like the father? We can do that one. The long-dead Timur the Great had once passed through Iran. His lasting legacy of there is prosperity and glory, the very pillars of which Eurasia upholds. We need to send foreign dignitaries to the Shah and obtain permission to excavate his land, but do so covertly enough that should we find anything of great importance, the locals will not try to seize it from us. I guess so, why not? Do we have to balance that out? We might have to balance that out, actually. Uh, we're doing well here. Let's keep doing some more arty, maybe? I like arty. Project Cold Waters. The old captain was smirked as he placed down an old vodka, preserved with the heart of the ship for eight years. The Arctic night was harsher than any battlefield from his memory, and yet the man couldn't help but marvel at the students below. They chose to forfeit comfort in exchange for knowledge and the spirit of adventure for a moment. He remembered his youth, a sense of wonder about the world now squashed by the weight of reality. Just as the captain was about to turn in for the night, a shout came from camp. Turning, he spotted a boy running towards the ship, his outstretched arms holding some dark object. Captain, oh captain, get ready to sail, we found it! The student held an old plank, covered in snow, but the moonlight revealed old word. Zeitstevel. Within the hour, the crew was headed back to the mainland. The captain had asked for the artifact to be brought to his quarters. Brushing his hand along the wood, likely part of some ancient vessel, the man thought of the past. He remembered a time when Russia was free to explore the Arctic unafraid of Western vessels. He remembered Eurasia. Cool. And then we will do the elder sibling. Russia, as the oldest surviving member of the Eurasian family, has a responsibility to help its young kin. Abused and denigrated for centuries, there is much healing of relations to be done. Our brother nations need a strong shoulder to lean on, and a big brother to protect them as they develop. Yes, Russia will always be the strongest, most responsible of the super ethnoses. But that is a result of historical circumstances, not a pursuit of the supremacy. We'll respect each other and every member of our family, no matter what comes. The other super ethnoses have kept us divided for far too long. Cool. Oh, there's not a lot on the right side here, okay. A project like the father. Ge geography itself dictates the Middle East as a part of Asia, and therefore a Eurasia. However, the creative of civilization has been neglected by the fates. Ravaged by war and Germanic corporations, the once proud nations such as Persia live out their miserable existence in servitude. If Eurasia is to be successful, it must prove that the southern lands must are an integral part of our people. Indeed, Timur the Great, descendant of the universal ruler himself, once stormed the Middle East. His hordes overran its puny defenders, destroyed Persia, establishing a lasting legacy there. Our expedition teams are staying by to journey to Khorasan in eastern Iran. Legion has it that Timur the Great pacified a revolt there, exemplifying the qualities of a Eurasian, discipline, honor, and temperance. The Iranian government, unfortunately, is not so keen to let us in. Dominated by foreign interests, the puny nation scrambles to scrap any economic independence it can get. Its leaders demand that we lease some resources in exchange for the Khorasan. Uh, steel? We can give them steel, that's fine. Actually, how much steel do we have? We have more than enough steel. Yeah, have some steel. I hope it goes well for us, but there's no guarantee, of course. And we'll do the ooh, final rest. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Let's do... Project Brutus. Push comes to shove. The Romano Germanics have overstepped their boundaries decades ago and continue to do so now. If the weak world Atlantis and pathetic Japanese will not do anything about it, Eurasia will. A terror attack needs to be staged on the Eternal City itself. We will deny all responsibility, of course, but shall take shall shake their peasantry to the roots. Oh, what is ancient city, huh? Or maybe far flung. Oh, uh, the Brutus. We'll see what happens with them. And we have enshrined the Eurasian dream. The outcome of our effort shall be revealed to us. Oh boy. Oh boy. Let's do great minds. Yeah, we'll do great minds next. Project like father. Partial success. The archaeology team has arrived from Coruscant. The journey was difficult as their dig was interrupted by a group of bandits, luckily hired by barbaric Germanics. However, powered by superior Eurasian wealth, our scientists defended the site with a machine gun nest only sustaining 43% casualties. The following week was spent on charting the sea, consisting of red mountains overshadowing crumbling settlements. Izivsar was the only surviving city itself, pillaged in 1348, or 1384, but the Senate preserved all things. The following months <clears throat> was spent gathering artifacts and questioning locals, and a legend nomad spoke of Izivsar's walls being built from the bones of Timur's enemies, although the team failed to substantiate the theory. Nevertheless, pottery and tools were recovered and transported for further analysis. They do not have direct relations to Eurasia, but the propagandists can fix that. Cool. 
Oh, that's a lot of PP. 75, that's a lot. We're going to get a lot of PP. No wonder we get so much PP. The Elder Sibling is nice and engraving in stone. With the ideological uh, details decided upon, we now have a finalized constitution for Eurasia. With the blessing of a revolutionary guide, this will be the foundation for the greatest civilization the world has ever seen. Naturally, no deviation from this codified Bible of Eurasianism will be tolerated henceforth. For us, the Eurasian constitution will be the equal of Germany's Führer Prinzip, an unbending, unbreakable principle that directs us ever onward to greater glory. Nice. And one day, and great minds. Cool. And Project Brutus. It's not enough to convince our own people of greatness. For Eurasia to, to ascend to the place of global power, it must prove the inferiority of all other cultures. The Romano-Germanics are without a doubt the greatest threat to our young state. However, mere propaganda will not beat them. It is necessary to apply social pressure upon the peoples of Western Europe. The Italians style themselves as culture, culture and civilized. They display the blasphemous works in museums, wrecking their minds of their peasants. Our intelligence has taken initiative by hiring a former mercenary. They will be equipped with a makeshift bomb and sent to Rome, where they will attempt to stage an attack on the Colosseum, the symbol of Roman culture itself. Authorized. Cool. And Project Golden Legacy. The world is changing. Ancient forests are uprooted to make room for factories, and likewise old advantage of... Uh, ooh. And likewise, old grave sites will soon be home to housing complexes. We need to race ahead of industrialization and explore West Russia itself. The land is full of treasures, but we lack proper infrastructure to excavate them. We don't have much time before the secrets un underneath our feet are lost forever. How oh, pressure success. The uh, operatives successfully traveled to Rome, bypassing customs and local authorities. A, a complete bomb cannot be smuggled due to Titan security, so the agent took up the residence and hotel. Before the trip, they were trained on a construction of explosives, one was safely forged, a small bomb with a three-minute timer. The agent got to the Coliseum before being pursued by the police, who likely had monitored them. Although we are not sure of the details, it can be surmised that the agent initiated the timer and ran towards the structure, but exploded before he could deal significant damage. Local authorities have blamed the chaos on a gas leak, but even official casualties exceed a dozen people. We have failed to destroy the Coliseum, but we have dealt a blow to the Germano or Romano Germanic morale. A life well spent. Golden Legacy? Nice. And then we will also finish up with Heritage for the Future. The Eurasian state is young and fragile. At this stage, a single well-placed shock could see the nation fall well, along with its founder. This cannot be permitted to happen. Not after all we have done in the name of unity and strength. To preserve the heritage of Eurasia and ensure that no future generation forsakes it, Eurasianism must become the core of our education system. Every single child will learn the proper place and be indoctrinated in the correct methods of Eurasianist thought. Never again will fate-hearted questions cause us to lose their way. Exert influence in southern Europe, more political power, subsidize higher education, very good. Project Golden Legacy. It is widely known amongst uh, learned individuals that in our lands that relics of our Eurasian culture can be found in old buildings in buried towns. However, modern Russia has become distant from its native culture, not just in its historical conscience, but in geographical terms. Our archaeological teams have recently located several sites of great cultural and historical value within our borders, but report that they are located in difficult terrain where we cannot bring even motor vehicles reliably, let alone delicate measures, tools, and excavation equipment. To gain access to these sites, we need to invest in roads to transport necessary supplies to the sites, hire guards to fend off looters, and prepare transportation for any fines we make. This all needs to be done quickly to ensure that the project is completed in a reasonable amount of time as we have more pressing matters to attend to, set aside the funds, and America sends students. The Atlanticists seem to think us gestures. In response to a request for an intellectually driven discussion between academics of the two countries, they dispatch students. Granted, they come from top universities, but this is a slight against the legitimacy of our nation that cannot be ignored. Still, better than nothing and the porcelain king. The old Chinese emperors were rumored to have been buried in underground graves. We just sent another major expedition into China. Unfortunately, since most sites are located within the Republic, we still have to do with the government directly, which does suck. But, after that, we'll do Project Agartha. The mystic lands of Tibet are home to many lost treasures, from mountaintop monasteries where ancient monks guard relics of ages past, to the valleys and villages that hold the answers for generations. An archaeological team will need to be sent. <clears throat> or assembled, led by Dmitry Ivanov, a former soldier and scientist. Getting access to Tibet itself will be difficult, but the country is so starved for development that obtaining permission should be difficult. Eurasia, originating in the Mongolian steppes, has roots in Himalayas. Project Golden Legacy, a complete success! It was a chilly day, as yeah, as always, yet Gavrel felt like something was special about this one. He had been leading the project to search for signs of an ancient Eurasian civilization and had spent months building the infrastructure to find something that could prove the truth of the Eurasian identity. Now, he and his colleagues believed that they had struck a gold mine. We found something came a shot from the dig site. Something big, I think some sort of burial ground. Gavril jumped up excitedly. He knew it. Dig through the entire area. Make sure to recover any skeletons. A few hours later, an almost entire site was fully excavated. The age of this bureau ground almost certainly dates over hundreds of centuries ago, said one of his colleagues. This furthers the proof of a Eurasia dating back into the medieval era. Yes, yes, it surely does, replied Gavril. And just look at those skeletons, the size of them, the bone structure. This fits just in with everything we expected, proving the superiority of the Eurasian race. The way the bureau ground was hidden as well, it's almost like... 
like they only wanted it to be found by other Eurasians, said another explorer. No Romano Germanic could, could construct a bureau ground this advanced. Most certainly, uh, Gavrell replied giddily, and the treasure is by far the most majestic I've seen. Ancient gold coins, goblets, and statues, even a battle axe, still perfectly intact and as good as new. Only a Eurasian could be buried with this weapon. If a bureau site like, like this doesn't justify Eurasia, nothing else does. Make sure to search everything. What? Only five more legitimacy? What? 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 And after this one, we will go ahead and do this one. Uh, establish the Masterocracy National Army. Oh, we'll probably do that one. Uh, it's time for us to move on from the ra ragtag assembly of militias to keep our movement alive in the days of the Komi Republic. Eurasia will be a true nation, like every nation requires an army to guarantee its sovereignty and survival today. The Eurasian National Army is born. Rather than seeking to emulate Western ways of war, we shall cultivate a uniquely Eurasian ethnos. Our inspiration will be the Druza of the Rus and the hordes of Genghis Khan. The deviant strategy of the ethos of the Red Army will pollute our martial tradition no longer in por project, project Porcelain King. We received news from back from our archaeologists sent to China that they have come upon an impasse with the Chinese authorities. Our archaeologists are interested in excavating a large group of historic mounds to search for the remains of great warriors, unfortunately. The Chinese are less than enthused about ruining their cultural and historical heritage. It seems our only way of gaining access is through negotiation, especially the monetary kind. We have three options going forward with this. First, we will send money to the archaeologists to bribe the officials. It is no secret that... Uh, <clears throat> the how corrupt the Chinese government is, and bribery will be the cheapest option. However, it is not certain if the officials will accept the bribe no matter how much it is. There may be better yet more expensive options. We could possibly offer the regional government money in exchange for inviting us to excavate the bureau grounds. Those would be much more expensive, as they certainly would never accept a small bribe. However, it is once again uncertain if they will accept. While they probably need money, they will, may not be willing to take it in favor of letting us into the mounds. Our last option is negotiating through, a, through agreement with the Chinese government. While probably having the most ex chance of success, it is by far the most expensive, and our biggest worry is that it could be a large waste of money if there turns out to be nothing of use in the mound. Although, if there is, the value of whatever is hidden beneath the earth could easily repay it. Our archaeologists are starting to get impatient, so we should make a decision quickly. Bribe, offer, agreement. Make an agreement. I don't care. The cost for Eurasia is... There's no cost for Eurasia. So, And debt is but a number, as I've been so thoroughly told several times. Um, For now, let's get better tanks. I'll get better guns, because we, we're kind of lacking here anyway, so that'll be good to do. And I want to see what if this has anything to hold for us as well. Uh, Project Por Porcelain King, a uh, partial success. Cyril sat in his comfy chair, observing the excavators do the work. Their archaeology dig had been going on for a few days now after the successful negotiations with the Chinese. Exploring the smaller mounds without any luck, they had finally begun to crack open the largest one. I think we found the entrance, boss, said one of the diggers. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get inside. Cyril got up out of his chair and notified the Chinese. They found something. Inside was dark, with only small bits of light coming through the holes in the top. Turning on his flashlight, Cyril and the other archaeologists ventured into a large cave. What is it? said another archaeologist. Ancient warriors and imperial grave, diamonds and gold? Unfortunately, quite the opposite, it seems, Cyril said, shocked at what he was seeing. Unending piles of skeletons filled the room, their eerie eyes fixated on the archaeologists, with bones scattered all over. This wasn't the grave of mighty warriors, it was a mass grave of those slaughtered by the warriors. It appears to me that this is a mass grave from an ancient Mongolian invasion, said one of the Chinese officials, and broken Russian. Since this is the property of the Chinese government, we will be taking all the valuables within. I'm glad you decided to excavate this for us, it was definitely worth it. Cyril and the archaeologists stood there, stunned. Had they dug the wrong grave? Were the greatest great warriors buried in another location? The Chinese surely would not let them excavate another mount. It was at least, though, worth a try. And across the wall. Our great enemy lies across the Euro Mountains. While our armies are strong, they have the advantage of geography. And why not organize a strike team to kill two birds with one stone? Firstly, we'll pierce enemy lines in a non provoking raid, obtaining useful information on the opponent. Secondly, we will have a short window to explore the mountains and find something to note. But if you enjoyed this longish video, please do consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will go ahead and kill off Omsk and do more finding the glory of Eurasia. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.